Hi and welcome. This is Joe Crowder here. Uh, another lecture for history. Uh, we're going to take a, a, a look today in early colonial America at trade, slavery, and God. That's my best Chicago. Apologize. Hey, this is uh, the interior of the New Room Methodist Church built in 1739 in Bristol, England. The founder of the church is very famous. His name is John Wesley, not the founder of Methodism, uh, although much of the Methodist church is, is ascribed to John Wesley. He had a little help with George Whitfield, who is the true founder of the religion. Anyway, there's a problem with the design of this particular church. I want to see if you can pick it out. It's not a problem. It's actually a solution. give up now before I, I give you the answer of what the solution is you have to kind of know I guess what the problem is here's this Methodist Church in in Bristol England and, and, and to know a little bit about religion in the early 18th century it is still a very volatile topic to create an entire new belief or a new dissenting faith such as Methodism in an area where in England there's a state religion it still is you have the Anglican Church it's the Church of England um, in, in the early 18th century uh, much like the 17th century in the 16th century uh, to have a religion outside of the official state doctrine was against the law so here uh, in the early 18th century just like previous centuries we have a brand new church a brand new religion and the problem is and the solution is both apparent there are no windows on the first floor when they first built this Methodist Church in the year 1739 crowds came by and uh, crowds would show up with uh, rocks and just break out all the windows at one point the preacher was so angry I guess uh, but they had to tear the church down and they had to build a new one and when they built the new church they built no windows on the first floor uh, just so to make it so that people couldn't break the windows anymore and then they built they built it not on the street but further back from the street so here's a picture uh, in Bristol uh, from the street to where the actual church is in the back so you see the statue behind the statue is the entrance into the new room when George Whitfield, who is the founder of Methodism, ventured from Bristol to proselytize in 1742 London. He found a very tough audience. In a letter to a friend, he wrote that there was some noise among the craftsmen and that I was honored with having a few stones, dirt, rotten eggs, and pieces of dead cats thrown at me. This is the way people protested back in the early 18th century. They would throw cats at you, dead ones, and stones and dirt, and they would break the windows of your church. Uh, just to let you know, this is kind of where I'm going to start this particular thing. Why am I starting it here? Because it's in Bristol. Bristol, England. Bristol, England in 1700 is the center of the slave trade for England. In 1700, Bristol was the third largest city in the country. Three quarters of all Chesapeake exports ended up in Bristol. It was the second busiest port when I say three-quarters of all the Chesapeake exports, you should say so. No, you should say wow, because the Chesapeake Bay is huge. The Chesapeake Bay is far north as Philadelphia. So we have Washington, D.C., we have uh, 
Baltimore, we have, well, we didn't have Washington, D.C. back then. It didn't exist. But we have Philadelphia, Baltimore. We have all of the Virginia, Chesapeake. The Maryland, Chesapeake. The Delaware, Chesapeake. Uh, we're talking hundreds of thousands of square acres, if not square miles, of people growing tobacco. People growing products. People manufacturing goods, particularly in Philadelphia. And all of that, three quarters of it, is going to one place. And that would be Bristol, England. So it's a huge deal. But, well there it is. In 1698, the Royal African Company's charter is revoked. Now remember last week we talked about how there was a lot of anger particularly from the West Indies in the Caribbean about how the Royal African Company was not supplying enough slaves to the West Indies let alone America and these great plantations, these sugar plantations in the West Indies the uh, great tobacco plantations and rice plantations it's in uh, the Chesapeake and the Carolinas they were screaming for more labor and the Royal African Company was not able to do it so we turned to what smuggling right that, that was part of what we talked about last week the new king William and his wife Mary revoked the charter and it allowed Bristol to do what this was where the Royal African Company was centered, was in Bristol. But now that Royal African Company charter, it's gone. It's abolished. So what I'm saying is that very soon, Bristol had some competition. And the competition came primarily from two other cities. And I know this map is actually skewed 90 degrees sideways. Uh, so you see the little N up there, north is that way. So we're actually, I tilted it sideways for a reason so it could fit the screen. <laughs> uh, but there's two cities that will now compete with Bristol for the slave trade. Once that charter is removed, it's, it's okay for other cities to begin, any port cities to begin, any merchants in these port cities to begin looking to begin trade of their own in slaves. And those two cities are Glasgow and Liverpool. What I'm telling you folks is the first true competitive and therefore capitalistic venture from England. The very roots of capitalism involved wholesale human trafficking, slavery. But Bristol is not just the center of the English slave trade, no. Britain is also involved in other forms of trade. But to get back to Glasgow, Liverpool, there was another town that didn't quite make it on the west coast of England, Whitehaven. All of these towns started to compete with Bristol to see who could bring slaves to the New World. Liverpool and Glasgow are cities that primarily grew from nothing to dominate the west coast of what is now the UK. These cities were built on the backs of the slave trade. Bristol was already a predominant city, but as we go through the 18th century, Bristol will lose more and more of its predominance. 
to cities like Liverpool and cities like Glasgow. It's competition. It's capitalism. And human beings are the targets. Or the commodities. Bristol was also at the center of the convict trade. So here we have a picture of British or English convicts chained by the neck walking to a skiff that will take them to a ship that will then transport them all the way to the Chesapeake area in the Virginias. Bristol was not just at the center of the English slave trade. Bristol was also at the center of the convict trade. The convict trade began in earnest in the year 1718 not just in Bristol, but throughout all of England. About 50,000 convicts would be dispatched to the colonies from England in these years, 1718 to 1773. And a fifth of them will come from this one city, Bristol. Indentured servants are also at the center of Bristol trade. Bristol will export 10,000 indentured servants between the years 1651 and 1686, most of them going to three places, Virginia, Barbados, and the island of Nevis in the Caribbean. That's pretty much where Bristol concentrated on. Bristol was at the center of trafficking indentured servants. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a nasty trade. But this is also the, the reality of the world. Bristol trade in the year 1700 was made in human beings. The city itself made its money on slave, servants, and convicts. That's what made Bristol. This is what made Liverpool. This is what made Glasgow. They grew on the backs of human trafficking, the first mass and successful capitalistic adventure probably anywhere in the world. So let me ask you, is it any wonder then that people began to pray? that they began to question the morals of the world. Smuggling, human trafficking. If you were of the lower ranks of society, what would your perception be? How would you perceive the world? How would you begin to question the value of human life? The value of your own life? Was it worth anything at all to anyone? This is the early 18th century. A globalized network of trade in human beings the purpose of making money. Is it no wonder that people began to pray? They began to open up their Bibles and look for meaning and salvation in a world that was just this nasty and cruel. Welcome to the Great Awakening. Here we have a picture of George Whitefield, founder of the Methodist Church. He's a dissident, ladies and gentlemen, a dissident. This means he doesn't follow the law. He doesn't follow English law, which dictates that the only true religion in England in Britain, 
in the empire is the Anglican religion, the Church of England. So what you see here is George Whitefield standing on a podium preaching outdoors. But what's even more important is who he is preaching to. George Whitefield is preaching to the poor. Now why is this significant? He is preaching to the poor in a world that is just nasty and mean. What is he telling these people? What is he informing them of? What is he yelling at the top of his young, at the top of his lungs? Why are these people swooning as they are near the front row? Why are people climbing trees and blowing trumpets? Welcome to the Great Awakening. There's a close-up, George Whitefield. First of all, we have to think about religion sort of as entertainment, sort of. Because he was entertaining. To understand the impact of George Whitefield and to understand his oratory power and how different he was from other preachers, Anglican preachers, Puritan preachers, there are no preachers in Quakers' uh, meetings, uh, this is profoundly different what he did. Because if you went to see an Anglican preacher or a Puritan preacher, what you went and saw and witnessed was a man who had a preacher, and they were men back then, who had studied his whole life divinity, who majored from college in theology, who spent five, six, ten years doing nothing but studying the word of the Bible and what it means to their particular faith. And then by luck, or by draw, or by connections, they would come to somehow have their own church. And they would write their own sermons. And when they are in that church, preaching their sermons, it is an intellectual pursuit to meld your mind to that of God. Intellectual. Step by step, reason, logic, enlightened thought, however you want to put it. But that was not George Whitefield's way. See, Whitefield and preachers like him that preached outdoors to the poor, well, they had to catch their attention somehow. Their style of preaching with fire and brimstone and fear. And it was entertaining as all hell. <laughs> it is a pronounced shift, ladies and gentlemen, from the intellectual to the emotive. We're not going to challenge people's reasons anymore. We're challenging, challenging them on the basis of their gut. A gut feel, an emotion, when George Whitefield and other preachers like him begin to preach, they are preaching to the poor. And they are telling the poor that you are equal before the eyes of God. That that particular duke or earl or lord or knight that sits in that big huge mansion on the hill is no better than you before the eyes of God. Your soul is cherished. You have your own personal connection to Jesus. Your soul 
is not inferior in heaven. Now, if you're poor in a mean world, you've got my attention. Hmm. George Whitefield, he was the founder of the Methodist Church. Preached outdoors. It's Whitefield. I forgot the E. Benjamin Franklin challenged people to follow his footsteps and become ecumenist. What? Ecu what? Ecumenist. Meaning that we're just all Christians. Whether you're a Quaker or a Puritan or a Presbyterian or a Calvinist. Doesn't matter. Catholic. We're all Christians. We all should look at the world with Christian eyes and Christian faith and Christian love and Christian brotherhood. In other words, Quakers shouldn't be fighting Puritans and Puritans shouldn't be fighting Presbyterians and on and on and on. Catholics and Protestants, can't we all just get along? Really, that's the ecumenist ideal. Now, Franklin was in Philadelphia in the early 1740s when a young George Whitefield showed up and he actually walked the crowd as George Whitefield was at the Philadelphia State uh, the Philadelphia City Capitol building and and he was watching Whitefield preach to this crowd this huge crowd and he decided that it was so crowded that he could figure mathematically how to count this crowd that he would walk in one direction and count his steps as best he could and walk in another direction and count his steps as best he could and kind of create sort of a rectangle and a triangle here and a dodecahedron over there and, and then use the formulas and knowing that how many people were packed per square foot he could figure out the size of a crowd and he estimated that the crowd that George Whitefield was preaching to in the early 1740s in Philadelphia was about 30,000. Now this is without microphone. That man had a voice. And later in a letter to a friend, uh, Franklin wrote that one could not walk through the town in an evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street after Whitfield had preached. And it stayed that way, according to Franklin, for like a couple of weeks. So powerful and convincing was the oratory of George Whitefield. What was at stake, ladies and gentlemen, in the colonies is what Jonathan Edwards would come to so famously state, that God is in the now. And this is, this is profound. It's even profound un unto us today. So let's walk through this. First thing that's at stake in the local colonies, uh, or excuse me, in the colonies is local politics. Politics in the colonies in the 1720s is based on the membership of a church. You had to be both a property owner and a member of the church in order to vote in many towns up and down the Atlantic seaboard especially in New England but it's true in the middle colonies and it's true in the southern colonies so if you were in the city of Philadelphia for example to be a voter in local politics in Philadelphia first you had to own property second you had to be a member of a particular church now this is where Philadelphia is one of your more cosmopolitan cities. So there's a lot of different churches in Philadelphia. So you would have Anglican churches in Philadelphia, but you would also have Quaker home, uh, meeting, meeting places. You might have a Puritan, Presbyterian, certainly. Calvinist. All of these different memberships have different point of views on politics have different point of views on certain issues that come up before the general populace. 
So if a majority of your city, in the case of Philadelphia, is Quaker, then your Quakers are going to vote in block, most of them. And therefore, most of what Philadelphia passes locally in legislation will be from the Quaker perspective. But when you start getting these new religions start coming in, and they start converting people to either the Methodist or the Baptist persuasions, then you are weakening your block to where you can become a minority religion in your own city that you founded. This happened in New England, where Puritans had been, since its founding in 1620, in charge of the city of Boston, Plymouth, Salem, Northampton, and on and on. But now people are converting to become Methodist or to become Baptist. And, the, and your block of members are losing votes in local politics. I don't think that that's not important. There's also the idea <clears throat> of Juris Civilis versus Juris Ecclesiastics. What? The rule of law, Juris Civilis, versus the law of God, Juris Ecclesiastics. You hear this now. This is an argument that has been put forward by some members of the religious right in 2012 that God's law trumps the Constitution. That the United States Constitution is subservient to the law of God. And if there's something in the Constitution that I do not agree with, I do not have to follow it because I follow a higher law. This is something that is alive and well today. It was alive and well back in the early 18th century, and it was alive and well and fought over for hundreds and hundreds of years in Europe, to the point where Europe almost destroyed itself, killing nearly a fourth or maybe even a third of its own population until the end of the Thirty Years' War in 1648. If we go back to the Salem Witch Trials, we see what happens with Juris Ecclesiastics when it gets out of hand. And it took a governor who used Juris Civilis to bring order back into that colony. So this is an argument that's still with us today in the 21st century. This is at stake with the Great Awakening. The old lights of New England were particularly vulnerable. And by the old lights, I mean the Puritans. They're the originators of the colony. They are the law and order of Massachusetts. But as the population grew, as the third and fourth generations started to come into existence, as trade became more and more flourishing, as there was more and more influence from outside of Massachusetts, as there was more opportunities elsewhere around the world, more opportunities within Boston, more opportunities to make money, We learned in our book about the Halfway Covenant, which began back in the 1640s and 1650s, even back then. We had people who were not choosing not to become members of the Puritan faith. And the only way that Puritans could keep the faith was to attract them in a halfway promise. Meet us halfway. And then once you see the light, you can go the rest of the way. That was the plan. It didn't quite work out that way. Jonathan Edwards, who's pictured here, 
was a Puritan. Was. He becomes, according to many historians, one of the sparks that created what we call the Great Awakening. Jonathan Edwards was from Northampton, Massachusetts. He had grown to become very well respected in the Puritan Church. In 1733 he gains entrance into a new church that was built and becomes its head, its preacher, but he starts preaching differently. He's not preaching intellectually like Puritans are supposed to. He's preaching fire and brimstone. He's preaching fear. He's trying to work on people's emotions. And at first it draws crowds. But eventually, by 1735, he's going to be removed. The, the, the congregation will split and vote, uh, barely, to remove him from the head of their church. So he moves on and starts to head south and preach south with people like George Whitefield. He is most famous for a 1742 sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And I don't know how Jonathan Edwards preached this. I don't know his tempo. I don't know his method. I don't know if he screamed it, if he yelled it. I don't know. But I have the words in front of me, a little paragraph of it anyway. The most famous excerpt is this. That the God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider, or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you, and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are ten thousand times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful, venomous serpent is in yours. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince. And yet it is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. That's powerful stuff. That's a gut check. People would scream, save me, save me. I don't want to burn in hell. Help me be saved by God. Don't make him move his hands. Help me have God hold me. This is how they converted people. In the year 1756, an admiral in the British Navy was uh, arrested for uh, not doing his best and it was a propaganda campaign it put out against this particular admiral for uh, the crimes that he allegedly committed and here we have a drawing of John Wesley the preacher loved to preach outdoors on the hanging podium preaching outdoors trying to save the soul of this admiral there are repercussions from the Great Awakening first thing that you really ought to know is that for the first time there was a huge movement particularly by Baptist but Methodist too but especially Baptist in the south would go down to the slave plantations and attempt to convert them all to Christianity And the slaves held an ear up because these Baptist preachers told them of the Exodus, the story of Moses 
leading his enslaved people from Egypt through the Red Sea to the land of Canaan. Milk and honey. Wow. These were the Baptists down in the south. And so much so, this is where we, we, we can bring it fast forward to the 20th century, the most famous Baptist preacher of them all, Martin Luther King Jr. Member of the First Baptist Church of Alabama. women were a huge part of the Great Awakening. Because women are told that in the eyes of God their souls are just as equal as men's. That God sees no gender in heaven. That angels in heaven have no gender. Further, Going to see George Whitefield or Jonathan Edwards or any of the other great awakening evangelical preachers is downright fun and entertaining. Gets you out of the house from doing all the chores, milking the cows, skinning the goats, preparing a chicken for dinner. Ah, let's go into Philadelphia and watch some of the fireworks. One of the things that we see in the Great Awakening is a demand by the poor who have been told that their souls are equal before the eyes of the Lord. We are going to see, certainly in the middle ranks of society, people who are of some means but don't own property, a demand for the vote. And you are going to see at least those who are white and poor but still a member of the community and maybe eking out an existence as a farmer or a peddler who's also going to demand a vote. This all comes sort of. There's a belief in the wisdom of the common wheel, the common man. That some things that the common man has to say is actually quite wise. And one of the reasons for this, ladies and gentlemen, is that the lower ranks of society are usually your most conservative elements of society. Conservatism is uh, a belief in keeping things the same, not changing. And I'm telling you, as a historian who studied this, and there's many who will back me in on this, that the people who least want to change are those who are downtrodden and poor. And the reason for that is most of them are peasants, most of them are working on the farm, and you tell them a new farming method, they're not going to believe you. Because they're barely making it as it is. Even though you might be able to double the yield of the productivity of their farmland, they don't want to hear it. Change is hard. Change is difficult. Change only comes mostly when it's directed from the top. It's the uber wealthy when they give the nod, okay we're gonna make a switch, that's when change happens. Mostly. Through history. Hmm. There's a belief that in the Great Awakening then, if God is or considers me to be equal to that fancy pants rich guy over there, then why can't I be a citizen? Why does the fancy pants guy get to be a citizen? And I do not. I want to be a citizen too. I want to be able to affect the politics of my state, of my city, of my church. I want to have a vote. I want to be a citizen. I want to participate Another repercussion of the Great Awakening is that promotion of localized democracies. And I want you to think of New England in particular on this, because this is where the Great Awakening really took off first in North America, in the colonies, and spread south from there. And then when we get to it in the 1770s, when the British begin to crack down, particularly on Massachusetts, what they're doing is they're breaking up 
these localized democracies that had flourished since the Great Awakening. And that's, you know, 1730s, 1740s. So we're going to go for another 30 years, really. Maybe 40. So that's like two generations of localized democracies now being told that they are by the state, by the empire, by the mother country, that you are no longer viable. You can't give people liberties and then take it away. That's Machiavelli, chapter 5, one of our primary documents. So, we have a book by a historian named uh, Roger Anstey. And the title of the book is The Atlantic Slave Trade and British Abolition. So what I want you to do is, while I, while I kind of phrase what I'm going to say, is, is to guess the rate of return for the slave trade. So Bristol, we started with the story of Bristol, where the first Methodist church was created, where it was its windows were knocked out to the point where they had to knock down the church and build a new one so that there were no windows on the first floor. And we made a connection that a lot of these new religions, the Methodists and the Baptists in particular, are a reaction to changes in the global world order, the changes of human trafficking. Human beings are commodities. There are human convicts being transported by the tens of thousands. There are uh, human white servants in England, the poor mostly, being transported um, to become servants for five to seven years to the new world by the tens of thousands. And then slave trade in open competition by the millions being transported out of Africa. It is estimated by the year 1700 well over 2 million Africans had been taken from Africa and transported somewhere to the Caribbean, to Central South America, and to what is colonial America. Over 2 million by the year 1700. It is a mean, mean world. So for all this meanness, for all this angst, this global world that people stop and they start trying to figure out what does it mean to be a human in this, guess the rate of return for the slave trade. Because if you said alpha, 10%, then you're right. That was your profit margin. That's it. When the bills are all paid, you only made 10% on your British pound. Thomas Hobbes wrote the book Leviathan in 1651, and he wrote that worst of all. Men live in continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. This is the 18th century. This is Bristol in 1700. This is what I think, I believe, the Great Awakening is responding to. Let us pray. Till next time.